Hello, Gary Stearman here with Bob Ulrich to talk with you about our upcoming Orlando Prophecy Summit, March 28th through 30th. Bob? The big event is almost here. There are close to 2,000 people registered. There are still a few spots left, but the next best thing to being there is live streaming. We're here today to make that announcement. We're going to have some incredible messages live streamed from the main auditorium at the Renaissance SeaWorld Hotel in Orlando. You'll hear men like Mark Biltz, and he has thrilled audiences everywhere with his famous Blood Moon Phenomenon lectures. L.A. Morzulli, fresh off a trip to Peru where he's uncovered evidence that we believe may be DNA evidence of the Nephilim. Chuck Missler, who never failed to come up with an amazing prophetic message. Jonathan Kahn, author of The Harbinger, and many, many more. All you need to do is go to prophecyinthenews.com. There's a $50 live streaming fee to have all these messages brought into your home. Go and sign up and register today. Hello, Gary Stearman again. Time for another update from Prophecy in the News. This one being made for release on Thursday, the 6th of March. Avi Lipkin still in studio with us. And for the past couple of sessions, we've been talking about the situation in Ukraine and the situation with Vladimir Putin and what might happen there. And let's kind of summarize, Avi, and then before we move along to another topic. Okay, well, indeed, uh, I wanted to share that uh, Russia today has a population of 150 million people. Mm -hmm. um, the Ukraine has a population of 50 million. Now, of the 50 million, uh, approximately half are Russians. In other words, in 1954, Khrushchev, under communism and under Soviet socialism, gave all of this land, the eastern part of the Ukraine, all of this land, he gave it to the Ukrainians as a gift. We shouldn't forget that Khrushchev was a Ukrainian. And everyone was uh, kumbaya. Everyone was palsy walsy under communism. And so he gave the Ukraine this land on which are settled maybe 20, 30 million Russians. And so what the Russian army, I believe, is going to do is they're already here in Sebastopol. They're going to go in and they're going to come in from different directions. Kharkov definitely returns to Russia, Donetsk, Nepopetrovsk. This whole area is going to return to Russia with its 20 million people. So Russian population will grow from 150 to 170. A lot is in the numbers. But America you, on, you previously described that invasion as something that would bog, bog uh, Putin down. In other words, ultimately, it would not be to, to his success at all. Right. In other words, the, I believe the U.S., the European Union, um, maybe United Nations. Well, the United Nations can't do anything because the Russians have a veto. But there will be sanctions. It will hurt the Russian economy. Uh, it's not going to be very, very friendly to the Russian invasion of the Ukraine. We, again, I want to repeat from past session that the Russians took South Ossetia and Abkhazia away from the Georgians. Uh, they have on their sites Latvia, which is 40% Russian. In other words, I think what Putin wants to do is to regather all the exiles with the, the land oh. back into the new Russia and bring the population back up to, say, 200 million and of Russian people. And that will give Russia, in his opinion, more unity, more strength. Um, America is 307 million people, and the European Union is 350 million people. So Russia needs that population. Russia needs the land. I'm You're talking, talking now, about this being an ethnic battle, then, not merely a battle for territory, but a social kind of an ethnic regathering. And, and Putin really wants to create a new Russia. Is yes, he wants to return as much as possible to the greatness of czarist Russia. I can't say communist Russia, because he doesn't want all the lands that were there before the breakup in 91. He wants only the lands that are Russian, Russian people, and to strengthen his numbers, uh, up to 200 million, let's say, um, strengthen the economy afterwards with Russian people, weaken, in his opinion, the Ukrainians. We mustn't forget, they're gonna find oil, and, and shale oil and shale gas in the Western Ukraine. So the Russian, Ukrainian economy will take off eventually. And it will link up with Poland. It will link up with the European uh -huh. Union. Um, but I think what, what Russia wants to do is to emasculate the Ukrainian uh, drive for independence. Now, the outcome. Let's talk about outcomes here. Where do you see this going? And uh, ultimately, I see this as a spiritual battle. Of course, I'm a Christian. I, I teach I, I, as a pastor, I, I interpret the Bible. Uh, we attempt to make sense of what the Bible is saying concerning Israel in the latter days and Israel's enemies and so forth and so on. And you're very familiar with what we do here. 
Uh, I see this as a spiritual battle, uh, uh, and this would involve the United States of America. Where's all this going? Where do you see it ending up? Well, <clears throat> what I see is that the Russian people, who are good people, people are good everywhere in the world. The problem is not the people, the problem is the mentality or the system. And you, you remember the great German philosopher Heinrich Heine? Yes. And he said 200 years ago, before the advent of socialism and communism or during the time of the czars, he said the world is going to have to choose. This is 200 years ago. The world will have to choose between the foolishness of the Americans and the despotism and tyranny of the Russians. Mm. Now, you heard of the Magna Carta? Oh, yes. I mean, that's not in America. It's in Western Europe. Right. But the Magna Carta is part of the beginning of democracy. And, of course, you heard of the Enlightenment and the Renaissance and the development of uh, the American Revolution and all these great things that happened in the West of Europe. None of this ever happened in Russia. Hmm. Russia has never had a democratic system which is benign to its people. The Russians have always suffered under autocratic rulers. I believe in America, and my message in the Christian church is always is Christian revival in all denominations. And you know that Alexis de Tocqueville said in the 1840s, and I'm paraphrasing from Eisenhower, who you know s summarized the, the very thick book in two sentences. He said, America will be the greatest country on earth because the American people are a good people and their pulpits are on fire for the Lord, hmm. meaning yeah. a Christian country. Right. Conversely, America will lose its preeminence in the world when the churches have lost their fervor for God, which is what we see happening today. Now, regarding Israel, 70% of the American people call themselves Christians. 70% of the people of America support Israel. 80% uh, of Congress, bipartisan, supports Israel. The military supports Israel. The problem that Israel faces always over the last decades is the State Department and the White House because a lot really is about the economy. You know, American people kind of like ignore what's happening with the economy. By the, that goes back to the Roosevelt era. And World War II. World War II. Pre-World War II yeah. even. Pre-World War II. Six absolutely. million Jews died because the Arabs dictated to the Americans what to do because the, the Americans, the Brits, and the Canadians did not want the Arabs to go over to the Nazis who were their natural allies. So anyway, so I believe what we're going to see here is that America is foolish in the Lord and always comes out number one. And I believe we saw the Arab Spring. Mm -hmm. You know, who would have ever thought that Mubarak would be overthrown or Gaddafi would be overthrown or Ben Ali in Tunisia or Saleh in Yemen or Bashar al-Assad. So all of a sudden the whole Middle East is going up in flames. It has nothing to do with Israel. It has nothing to do with the Jews. Uh, it has something to do with the Christians because they're slaughtering their Christians. It's the end of, uh, of the Christians in the Middle East unless the world wakes up and stops it. You look at Putin. You just had the Sochi Olympics. This was a great coup for Russia. There were problems, but overall, it was a great victory for the Russian people. Now Russia is going to lose everything because Russia is going to go into a quicksand. It's going to go into a swamp. And that's God's way of saying the Russians may have wisdom. The Russians are good people also. But if they don't have the spirit of the Lord, there's going to be a problem. One of the things that really shocks me is that Putin himself said that what made Russia great was Christianity. And we shouldn't forget that under communism, Christianity was banned. All religions were banned. That's true, yeah. And so what Putin is doing is actually trying to go back to the Christian roots of Russia and the church, which was founded in 995 AD, to unify the Russian people, to give strength to the Russian people. The problem, one of the problems today is that there is something called the economy, and you're going to have like Israel, what they're trying to do now, boycott, divest, and sanction Israel. They're going to do this to Russia also. And another problem, the Muslims in Russia. The Muslims in Russia, the Chechens, the Circassians, the Tatars, you know, you're talking about nations that most Americans have never heard of, and you're talking about tens of millions of them in Russia of today, in addition to 200 million Turkic Muslims in the six republics that broke away. So Russia is going to be facing a great problem. Again, the, the Russian army very soon will have 50% Muslim con conscripts. So Russia is going to have to make a decision. Will it be a Christian country? If so, what does it do with its Muslims? And the world will be watching very carefully. Very carefully. So, so I think America still comes out number one. But America, and I say this in every church, in every group I go, America must have a Christian revival. America must return to its Christian roots. And 
I believe that there will be problems of Islamic terrorism in America, but I yeah. believe America will come out on top. Now, I think Christians watching us right now are, are perhaps universal in saying that we have seen a dearth of, of uh, Christian uh, growth uh, and power and influence in, in the last three or four decades. We've seen systems conspiring against Christianity, Christianity being marginalized, uh, and we're all saying to ourselves, well, there, a revival is impossible, basically. Uh, it just couldn't happen, and, and you know, we're over the hill. Like you, I don't believe that at all. I, I think that, that, that God uh, uh, could bring a revival that fast and may well do so. You see, I say two things. There are two types of Islam. I know we're running out of time. I'll do it in like two sentences. Uh, but, you know, there are two types of Islam. There's revolutionary, which is the 9-11 terrorists, and they have promised more attacks, 9-11 attacks on American soil. And it'll make 9-11 pale in comparison. So if there are more 9-11 attacks, and I believe them when they say they're going to do it, this will bring about a Christian revival. Secondly, the evolutionaries, the Saudis and others who have all their money invested in America, they want to convert America to Islam through their money, but I think it's going to fail also. And I think that the, the Americans will come back to their common sense. Well, Ivy, thank you for coming on and sharing your thoughts. It's always uh, a pleasure, always educational. God save America and God save Israel. Amen. And for those of you out here uh, watching us now, I would say pray for revival, uh, particularly in the United States. Uh, pray for a worldwide revival. Uh, Avi and I both believe that's the only hope that we have. And I'm praying for a Christian revival in the United States in particular and I do it every day. I would invite you to do the same. Avi, thanks. I'm Gary Stearman. Keep looking up, everybody. <laughs>